A Company of the 1st Battalion, led by Bob Barrow, who later became Commandant of the Marine Corps, a good friend of mine, brought a bunch of Marines up over the hills to Funchalon Pass. And he occupied those hills so that the Chinese could not have the capability to shoot down at the engineers who had to put the bridge across. Yeah. And they put the bridge across. Uh, well, it was a pretty, pretty spectacular event, the way they did it. And the way we, we had to cross, a Treadway Bridge has two rails across. Mm -hmm. And you had to walk across those rails and the trucks or tanks or whatever came across, the, the width of the bridge had to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One uh, truck went across and broke the control mechanism. Yeah. So they had to put a marine marines at each end, and they had to move the section back and forth, which they did. So they were able to. That's a hell of a job to do. Evacuated uh, some seventeen hundred vehicles like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of dedication, a lot of a lot of just smart things that guy people came up with at the makeshift. Mm -hmm. they, they, they reacted to the situation pretty doggone well. Now you know about the army. The army, poor guys, they got they were in bad shape. Uh, there were there were slightly over from the thirty one hundred people that they had in that regiment, and they only had two battalions. 3,100 people they had in that regiment, a little over 400 came out with us. The rest of them were either killed, prisoner, or evacuated. Yeah. So about 400 people, right? A little over 400, yeah. somewhere in that neighborhood. Their tanks came out because those guys were sheltered, but they really weren't up there in the, in the major fight with, uh, with the the, the 31st. That was that was a sad situation, very sad. What really helped them a great deal was a Marine uh, NFO team, a forward observer, air observer, had radios. They didn't even have radio communication. They were in bad, bad shape. We, uh, uh, on the night of the uh, Morning of the 10th, or no, no not, it had to be about the 8th now. Yeah, the 8th. We, we uh, started out of, out of uh, Kota Ri, mm -hmm. down to Chin Hung Ni. We went to Chin Hung Ni, and, and uh, there we, we caught trains. They had trains waiting for us to take us back to uh, Busan? To uh, Hamron. Hamron, Hamron, okay. A uh, story about the star in Kotori, right? Yes. And then you were talking about we drink to Jinhangni, right? Right. Yes. We were in, uh, we had arrived at, at Kotori mm -hmm. on the 8th. I, I personally arrived there on the 8th of uh, December. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, I, as the S2 of the battalion, I met uh, there with the uh, then Colonel Pol uh, then Colonel Puller, mm -hmm. who was the um, our regimental commander, mm -hmm. commander of the First Marines, and uh, received the latest uh, intelligence brief and discussed him. And that's where he made uh, his uh, famous statement. He said, uh, "Oh, uh, he heard the, the briefing by the intelligence officer, and he says, well, he says we're." We're co totally and completely surrounded. Now we've got them right where we want them. We can attack in any direction. Hmm. So uh, that was that was typical of, of a chesty puller. The weather was very bad at that time. Uh, extremely, extremely uh, cold. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they recorded the temperature, and with the wind chill, 
it was 65 degrees below zero. And, and uh, frankly, uh, you, you didn't worry too much about getting a small wound because you wouldn't bleed out. Right. Because it just freeze on you. <laughs> very, very cold. Very cool. Oh. We did manage to get uh, a little food there. We'd already got gotten our uh, Tootsie Rolls. I, I, I told you about yeah. the Tootsie Rolls. Yeah. We already got the Tootsie Rolls, and but we did get uh, a little hot food there. That really? Was the first time we'd had it. Wow. First time. And, what uh, What did you eat? Uh, scrambled hot eggs. Milk. Scrambled eggs. Uh huh. Scrambled eggs. In the cold field. Yeah. Wow. They made it. Must be good. It was cold. <laughs> <laughs> it so was not hot meal. Cold scrambled eggs supposed to have been a hot meal, but yeah. nevertheless we did get them. But as I said, the weather was very, very bad and it was overcast, down almost at ground level, at least the highest probably 200 feet. Hmm. Fog, snow, the whole works. <clears throat> we had to have uh, good weather because we needed, number one, we had to have air support. Mm -hmm. Our air support, we were moving in the day and uh, the Chinese would not fight mm -hmm. uh, very much during the day unless they were in very close contact with us. But they wouldn't have harassed us too much because we would have had air in them immediately. Mm -hmm. um, that plus the fact that we had to have a bridge, treadway bridge, uh, dropped. We didn't have a treadway, treadway bridge with us, and the only place we could get them was through through the supply system. And they had to be flown in from Japan, mm -hmm. and had to be airdropped at Kotori, and then would be trucked down to the Funchalon Pass, which was about uh, halfway down to chin on me. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a, a there was a power station there and at the power station was a, a course of a, a ravine, a large ravine, actually a, a mountainous chasm, mountainous chasm. And it, it um, uh, we, we had some 1,700 vehicles with us and all of our wounded. Mm -hmm and uh, dead. We, we carried out a lot of a lot of corpses also. Were you able to provide any medical help to them? Yes, oh yes, mm. yes. We had we had, uh, all, had doctors with us and we had uh, at, at uh, Cote Rie, we still had a still had a, uh, a hospital so to speak. Oh. You know, a field type hospital. I see. Yeah. Mass. Yeah, like mass. We mm -hmm. had that. So we were able to provide, uh, and our wounded as we went along, we were able to take care of them because in a, in a marine organization, every rifle platoon has, has two corpsmen. So I had, I had two corpsmen with me when I had the rifle platoon. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, those corpsmen, uh, my corpsmen actually delivered babies for Korean women, mm -hmm. actually did that. So. Uh, um, yes, we did have medical help. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the weather was so bad, we had to have air support in order to drop the bridges and in order to, to, have, uh, to fend off the Chinese and their attacks. Um, so the one thing we did is we prayed. Please help us. We need clear weather. That night, the sky opened up with all of this bad weather, and there was one star that we saw. One very bright star. That's the night of December 8th. Hey. Mm. So was it cloudy before you prayed? Oh, yes. Mm. yes it was completely overcast. Mm. Completely overcast and, and snowing and, and uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have much hope just looking at the weather and getting the weather predictions that we were able to get we weren't able to get too much 
because of our location. Mm. So we did pray. And it opened up and there it was. We knew then that we were going to be able to have air, air support. And bridge. And we were going to be able to get our bridges. Mm -hmm. So they dropped bridges later on and uh, they were able to truck them down to Funchalon Pass. Well, we, we fought our way down first. And from Chin Hung Ni, a company of Marines came up the, the, the mountain and fought their way up and took the, all the hills overlooking the Funchalon Pass. There's one big hill in particular, and the, we also had fighting coming up out of Koto Ri, taking the hills from that side. Mm. So we had the, all the hills surrounding, all the mountains, if you will, surrounding the pass were occupied by us, which enabled the Marine, the uh, engineers. Mm. There were Army and Marine engineers in this operation. And uh, they, they were able to put in the, the, the Treadway Bridge. I don't know whether I covered it before or not. But How long was that bridge? Could you the, tell me the kind of physical figure of those? Well, th there are sections to it, and it, uh, it was about, uh, I think, between 10 and 15 feet long, each, each section. And they, they hooked together, mm -hmm. and then they, they, made, they made enough, enough uh, uh, of a bridge in order to, to cross over the chasm. That must have been a it's quite an quite an event. Engineering work. The, the the thing about the engineers, and I think that that's important to bring in. Mm -hmm. uh, the engineers did remarkable work in this battle. They constructed two airfields. Yeah. Uh, one at Hagaru, the big airfield, and one small airfield at Kota mm -hmm. And the one at Kota used. Uh, well, they took uh, wounded out on such things as uh, TBMs and torpedo torpedo bombers uh -huh. that uh, they carry maybe a, a two to three wounded out on each one. It was a very small strip, very narrow. The one at Hagaru, of course, they brought in is uh, the C-117s, the old DC-3s, to do the, most of the evacuation. That's the way they evacuated there. But at, at uh, Hagaru, they took out over 4,000 wounded. Wow. So, um, and that included Marines and Army, both. Because the, the Army, as I said before, on the, on the east side of the Chosen, of the Changjin, rather, on the east side, they came down uh, across the reservoir when they were, they were decimated. They completely uh, broke them apart, hmm. and they had to, to organize into small groups and, and walk across the reservoir, across the frozen reservoir. We did have uh, uh, a uh, Marine, uh, I didn't cover it before, but talking about walking across the, the reservoir, the Marines took trucks and went, drove out on the ice and rescued the Army guys. So that the reservoir was frozen, right? Well, it was frozen enough for trucks. Right. Six by trucks, big yeah. trucks. Yeah. It's completely frozen. So that 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 was a benefit that they got from the fact that it was frozen, so cold. Mm -hmm. uh, once we crossed the the uh, Funchalan Pass, well, there was one other thing that happened there. The Chinese had blown. There was a railroad. That, that came from Chin Hung Ni up to Kotori at that time. And there was a, a, a bridge that they had to build. Uh, the, the, the railroad had to have a bridge. And that bridge was blown and was on the highway. Big steel bridge. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know how we'd get it off. And fortunately, we had an engineer, a master sergeant, mm -hmm. who said, I can get it off. And he pushed it off with a bulldozer. And they thought, they didn't think it would ever get it off. And they had to get that off too. 
in order to, to get to use the road, as it was right across the road. So the engineers were were pretty kind of the, the quiet heroes yeah. of the whole battle, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, do you remember the name of the uh, engineer corps? That was First Marine Division. First Marine Division uh -huh. Engineer Corps, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, Mark, do you remember? I, I'm trying to remember the colonel's name. It was Partridge. Yeah. Colonel Partridge. Partridge. The guy that went across the ice was a B, started with a B. Colonel, it was an older guy. Bale or. Oh, oh no, you're talking about uh, recover the, the yeah. people out on the reservoir? Yeah. That was. Uh, oh. I can't. I think his son became a general, didn't he? Yeah, he, 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 he uh, I'll, I'll think of it in a second, but anyway, mm -hmm. we'll come back to that if necessary. Um, the company that had fought its way up from Chin Hung Ni did a, did a, a, a remarkable job also. They recover, came up the, up the mountain, up over the mountains, and the Chinese were occupying all of that. They fought their way through all the Chinese. That were that were on top of the mountains, so that was a, a pretty remarkable feat, also. Well, we continued on down to Chin Hung Ni, mm. fighting all the way. Um, most of the heavy heavy fighting had now been accomplished. When we got to Chin Hung Ni, the third uh, armored. Army Division and the Seventh Army Division. What was left of the Seventh was part of it. The, the, the uh, 31st Regiment, which was east of Tiosin, was out of the Seventh Division, and they had a, a battalion that had fought its way up to just short of Koto Ri. The the, the uh, Seventh Division, mm -hmm. the 31st Regiment. That was the First battalion of the 31st Regiment that had fought its way up, um, and they came out with us, of course. Um, but so the what was left down south was uh, there were elements of the the uh, first corps of of the of Rock, the mm -hmm. Rock First mm -hmm. Corps was there. They were on mainly on the coast. Mm -hmm. They had been fighting up their way up the coast, and uh, but some of their elements were there, the 3rd Division, 3rd Army Division, and what was left of the 7th Army Division. So it was pretty much quiet right there. They, they had everything under control. So we were able to board a uh, train. It was, a, again, a railroad that ran down to the Hamlong area. Mm -hmm. On them, on, on, on Mary, where we went into a rest camp that they had put up. Uh, I remember I went to sleep uh, and I slept, and I, th I thought this was impossible, but I slept for 24 hours. Never woke up. And I was so, I was so groggy when I woke up that I couldn't even remember my name. Hmm. I, when you sleep like that, I guess that's one of the side effects. <laughs> but I, I was I was uh, very happy with that. Now uh, another thing that had happened. Uh, well, that, well, we we started we started to load out on the ships our equipment. The mm -hmm. Marines started to load out the First Marine Division equipment, and uh, we had uh, picked up a a uh, vehicle, an Army vehicle. Uh, my my particular company had picked it up, and we took it down to uh, the the uh, beach where we were supposed to load it aboard. And uh, an army colonel came over and said, "What are you doing with my vehicle?" And what had happened is he had sent a, a reconnaissance unit up to toward the reservoir, and uh, they had uh, abandoned the fight and. And uh, drove out, mm. and drove out with the, the vehicle, and the Marines picked it up. Mm. We picked up a lot of vehicles there, uh, Army vehicles, mm -hmm. 
that had been abandoned. And we came out with over 1,700 vehicles. We Owen spent, Beale. Uh, it was Owen Beale, General, Lieutenant Colonel. Owen Beale, yeah, that's right. We picked, that was the, the Colonel that, uh, that had the, the uh, motor transport battalion that helped pick up the soldiers off of the reservoir. His name was Owen Beale. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's alive now. But, but uh, we, we spent we spent about uh, five days there, and then we started to load out. And we loaded out, and I wound up on a ship that I had come over on, and I can't remember the name of it right now. But it was, I was still, we were all still suffering so much from cold, and we had so many on the vehicles, on the uh, ship, that you had to, we hot punked it. In other words, you got, you got to sleep for six hours in a bunk, and then another group would come in for six yeah. hours. And we did that around the clock. Um, I have had been a seagoing Marine before, so I knew where the heat on the vehicle mm. vessel was. So I went down to the engine room, yeah. and I stayed down there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I slept in the engine room. I didn't. I didn't use a hot bunk. Mm -hmm. We had around the clock. Round the clock uh, uh, chow lines, where you, you, you fed. You never you, 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 you'd eat, and then you'd you'd wait a little while, and you'd get back in the chow line because it wound up all the way around the ship. Mm -hmm. um, the only similarity that that I had was I was in charge of the evacuation of Saigon, also mm -hmm. back in 1975 or up in 1975 from that time. And we had as many as 5,000 refugees on a ship. And uh, of all the refugees that came out, many of them came out with us. There were, uh, as you know, over 90,000 of them. Um, we then transited down to Pusan, mm -hmm. and uh, our particular unit went out to a camp uh, right outside of Pusan. But could you describe the situation where there's so many Korean refugees also with you, and can you describe some kind of scenes? Well, they they uh, they were interviewed and searched, of course. Uh, they took as many as they could on the ships, on all ships. And I, I forget how many ships, do you remember from our research, how many ships we had? I uh, know that the one notable thing I remember is one Liberty ship, which is a small ship built for World War II, had about 18,000 Koreans on it. It's famous in Korea as yeah. a miracle ship. But Meredith? Probably over Miracles in there. Yeah. 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 But uh, they were all over the beach. They were kind of herded into groups and were being interviewed at, at that time. Mm -hmm. And there were, uh, there were uh, Korean police there too that were uh, interviewing them. Mm -hmm. I didn't get much very involved in that. That was not, not my, my job. Yeah. Um, when we arrived back down at Pusan, uh, at, at Pusan, what well, Nam, we, we embarked out of the yeah. port there. Uh, you know, I don't think you ever talk, talk very much about how those refugees followed you guys out down the road. Oh no. Well, which is one thing that one little vignette that I might offer when we left. Hagaru, mm. the Korean, uh, North Korean civilians were behind us, were not in our, in our group. Mm -hmm. We kept them out. Uh, there were mobs of them, I mean hordes of them, uh, thousands, really. Um, 
that they were anxious to get out, very anxious. My agents that I had, remember I told you that there were agents that, as the intelligence officer, mm. that I was given a, a group of six agents that uh, had been in the Chinese Army. Mm -hmm. um, Some of the Chinese mingled in with the civilians, and we shot them. Mm -hmm. One of the, the individuals we shot, one of the Chinese individuals, was one of my agents. So it means that he did spy? But he spied both ways. Both ways, double spy. Both yeah. ways. He watched too many movies <laughs> already. <laughs> yeah. But we were down, now I'll go back down to Pusan. Yeah. Because the main thing that we were when doing... When was it, Pusan? Pardon? When, wa when were you in Pusan, around? Uh, I think about about the 18th of December. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Yeah. And? We embarked, embarked, and then it took us about a couple of days to get down there. That's the best I can say. Yeah, yeah. I don't, really don't know. Mm. Um, we were now involved in building back up again because we knew we had to go back in the fight mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. And as I said before, some of the, a few of the rifle companies, the Marine rifle companies had as few as 20 effectives out of over 200 troops normally assigned to them. And those effectives were, that wasn't all wounded or killed. Uh, a lot of non-battle casualties, which we classified battle casualties. Mm -hmm. We had you had to be wounded in order to be a battle casualty. Right. But you, if, if you had frostbite, or anything like you're non-battle casualty. Mm -hmm. So that that uh, cut into us quite a bit. We were, and as I said before, that for example, the the uh, army out of 3,100 had a little over 400 that were able to fight their way out mm -hmm. with us. So the weather was probably the most brutal part of the, the battle, really. And the civilians that came out with us, the North Korean people that came out with us, were braving the same weather. They had the same weather as we had. And they didn't have the luxury that we had at Coterie, for example. And there, I understand that now that that group has, by they've estimated that that is over a million Koreans, that, that their descendants and so on since that time, yeah. there are now uh, over a million of those folks that, that were up there, mm. or their descendants were up there, their mothers, fathers, and so on. We were now reconstituting. And uh, Christmas was coming, mm -hmm. and my company commander, uh, my old company commander, I was still the battalion S2, and I was trying to regroup and get get my stuff together. <clears throat> and my old company commander called me on the phone and said, "Would you do me a favor?" He said, "I need somebody that can get the job done, and I want you to go down to Pusan." and get me a trailer full of beer, my troops. What a job assignment, huh? I told you, I had them all. Mm. I got them all <laughs> in that company. I took my old runner, uh, and I, I, I remember his name very well. He's a, my favorite runner, by the name of Wasilchek. Wazelcheck could do anything. <laughs> For example, I told you about when we 
embarked out of out of uh, Incheon to go up to Wonsan. Mm -hmm. Oswalczak was the, the, the gent that I sent out to get food. I remember that, yeah. And the one thing that we couldn't get is we couldn't get baking powder ah. and Wozniak found it. He's, he, he found it. Nobody else could find it, but mm -hmm. he found it. Well, when we went to, when, when I, now back to the beer thing, when I went to Pusai, I took Wozniak with me for that reason. <laughs> I knew he would be a big help. We got down there and we arrived, uh, I think this was the 23rd of December. And they had a LST down there that they allowed you to sleep on. People were passing through. Ozilchek found out about this for me too. So we went over there and spent the night. And uh, the next morning we got up went out to where our vehicle was parked, allegedly parked, it was gone. Somebody had stolen it. Hmm. So I said, oh God, now I'm in trouble. And Walthelcheck said, not to worry, Lieutenant, just relax a while, I'll be back. He came back with, uh, what do they call those vehicles now? Was the trainer on it? No, the, the, the mid midsize. The mules? Uh, oh, oh, a mule? No. Doggone it. I can't. Street quarter? Huh? The weapons carrier? Weapons carrier. He came back with a weapons carrier. We're bigger than a pickup. Yeah. And that's what we went after the beer with. <laughs> I went over to the warehouse. I found it, found out where the warehouse was, went over to the warehouse. It was an army warehouse. And he said, uh, uh, I told him what I wanted. I wanted beer. and said, uh, we don't sell the Marines. Hmm. So I said, uh, okay. So I went back to the, the boat and I sent Wazel check out. I said, Waz, I need a set. I had second lieutenant bars. I said, I need a set of first lieutenant bar, army first lieutenant <laughs> bars as soon as possible. Okay, Lieutenant. He went out, he came back in about an hour. I had the first lieutenant part. I went back to an army warehouse, different one. And I made up the unit I was from and I loaded up the weapons carrier with beer. <laughs> you have everything. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was Wazelcheck. I've never forgotten that guy. Uh, we're now getting up to strength, and we're getting pretty much put together again. With some gear. With some gear and everything. And, um, Christmas came, we had a good Christmas with the, some beer. We had a, a beer party. I went over with the old rifle company. Uh, the chaplain, my grandfather used to make wine. And he sent me a bottle of wine for Christmas, and it got to me. I don't know how I did it, but it got to me. And I had it in a bunk. We had a big tent. The, the, the battalion headquarters had a big tent. And I had it by my bunk, and while I was going over to the company, at the behest of the company commander to talk about the beer, it was taken. Mm -hmm. I tracked it down, and the battalion chaplain, took it. <laughs> Religious purposes, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. It's called Kumshaw. All that's Kumshaw. Kumshaw. So I didn't have any, but I had beer. I did have beer. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was it, and we were now gearing up to launch out in the attack again. To where? We were going north. To back to where the Chinese were. Right. And they were up by Hoang Song. Hoang Song, yes. Hoang Song, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Now you'll have to, you'll have to, and I, I forget the map. Hoang Song and then Chung Chan is north of there. 
You know what that meant? I don't know whether. Is that in that book? You said Chong Chun? Like, like me. What are we looking for? Chung Chung. Uh, is is Hong Chong south or north of Chung Chung? Chung Chung, I don't know. Doesn't show on here. Hoi so Chung. is it near to Hwang Song? Near, fairly close to Chung Chung. But Chung Chung is where I... Uh, it's I, on the coast there, just south of Wan Song. Oh, Hoang Song is? Hang song is okay, I got my, I got my, right there, is that it? No, that's Tung Song. Yeah. No, Hoang Song is H-O-E-N-G-A. Yeah, I, I know what that, what it is. Hang Song is around, around there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, at Hang Song, we ran into a, a a real a real tragic thing. There was a battalion of uh, I believe it was I believe it was a battalion of French or a battalion of some foreign uh, different to the United yeah. States, different. To uh, had been ambushed, well, and they ambushed a whole battalion, and it really shot them up. There were a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, debris, a lot of wrecks, and that sort of thing. And we had, there we received a lot of, uh, the Chinese were in pretty heavy around there, and there we received a lot of, a lot of our artillery fire, they now had artillery. Up at the reservoir, they didn't have artillery. All they had was mortars. And now they had artillery. Mm -hmm. So we ran into a lot of artillery there. I remember that. And then there, another good friend of mine there too. Uh, and we continued on up uh, just outside of Chung Chung. And uh, there was another hill, the hill that I was wounded on. Um, I left out one part. I was not battalion S2 now. Before we, when we were at, before we launched on Operation Killer, called Operation Killer, uh, we were, I was, I got, went to a regiment and got an intel brief and was, uh, went back to the battalion and was preparing a brief for the for the battalion for the company commanders and so on on our attack. <clears throat> and the, I was the only one in the tent at the time. And uh, I heard a voice behind me and said, "What are you doing, Lieutenant?" I looked back. It was Matthew Ridgeway, mm. General Ridgeway. And I jumped to attention, of course, and told him that I was preparing a briefing for battalion for our launch on Operation Killer. He had recently taken over the 8th Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, tell me about it. So I briefed him. I was able to brief him. And he said, well, that's very good. He said, I don't, I don't get quite that that much info in my briefs. I gave him the, the small unit detail. Yeah, yeah. So he appreciated it. He was a very, very fine gentleman. Had his grenades on. That's one thing that I remembered about him. Yeah. He, trademark. He, uh, trademark. His grenade. Uh, we were we proceeded in the attack and we we passed through a a uh, brigade of, of army, well, I'm, I'm ahead of myself again. Just before we launched an Operation Killer, I was transferred 
they got a they got a, a new group in new group of officers in. They mm -hmm. got a captain who was an intelligence officer. He became the intelligence officer, and the weapons company commander uh, Ed Simmons, who later was the Marine Corps historian, became the general. Uh, said, I'd like to have Gary for the weapons company. I'd like to have him for the heavy machine gun platoon. Mm -hmm. So I took over the heavy machine gun platoon. Yeah. And that's where I was for Operation Killer. Mm -hmm. We launched off on that January 15th. Mm -hmm. Sticks in my mind. That's right. I'll look it up. Might, might have been later. I don't know exactly. I don't think it was much later than that because we weren't in we weren't in uh, rest rest period that long. Or was there a period where the division was hunting uh, gorillas and, uh, uh, before Operation Killer? I don't you know. know. During the recovery period in the division, yeah, I, they, they, they did send small units out patrols. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, but nothing, no major, no major uh, operations. So this here, 22 Feb, 20 Feb to 6 March. Maybe I've got the wrong name. That's Operation Killer. Yes, sir. So you have new position, heavy uh, machine gun platoon. Yes, heavy machine gun. Yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting, very interesting job. Uh, the, the, the uh, base plate of a, uh, or the, the, not the base plate, but the uh, tripod or the heavy machine gun weighed, I think, 55 pounds. And that's a pretty heavy load to carry up hills and so on. So yeah. I spent a lot of time helping the kids. Yeah. It was, it was, it was tough. Um, we came upon a pretty heavy concentration. Well, before that, we passed through the 187th Airborne, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had been held up for a, two or three days and said that uh, this is a very, very difficult, very difficult uh, position. Uh, you're not going to be able to to move. We moved right through. The, the Marine Division did. Went right through it. So we're talking about over, over beyond Hwingsong area. Yeah. And there were Chinese soldiers. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, we now get as far as Chungchon. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's Chungchon. And on the uh, a big hill there, item company was uh, Bullfisher, Bullfisher's company, was in a, a pretty heavy fight. There was an opposing hill across the way. Hmm. Uh, he had one one in Vietnam, didn't he? Pardon? He had first battalion, first Marines in Vietnam. Bullfisher. Did he? Bullfisher? Yeah. Yeah, he's quite a quite a guy. He was the first lieutenant at that time. First lieutenant company commander. The only one we had. Uh, but uh, he was unable to advance because of the, the uh, Chinese were in very heavy, very good machine gun positions. So I brought my guns up. And uh, we started to fight back and forth. Machine gun fight. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I had to have another section and had another two two guns. So I went back to get them, and I went back with with uh, my platoon runner and uh, two other people because the Chinese were all over the place, and I wanted to be certain that I made it back to where where the rest of my platoon was and. Uh, mortars came in. They, they, they saw us moving mm -hmm. and put mortars up. Uh, next thing I knew, I was 
part way down the hill. I got a mortar right beside me. Uh, it, it killed two of my men there. But all I got was a bad wound here mm -hmm. and some wounds, some in my legs. Now the wound that I had here, the only problem with it was that when, I, when it blew me up, when I went in the air and I came down, I don't, I don't know. The only thing I knew was when I, when I came to, I was looking at my, my hand like this. It was completely more folded back. <laughs> I had like that. That's oh boy. Life. Now that was a pretty serious wound. That took over six months to. The bullet in the belly, and then next one is your completely. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the real one here. I got this one here. Uh, anyway, I I went ahead and took my guns back. I still had this this hand like this. It's pretty painful. Could you do that again? I want to put it into the video. I, oh, like yeah. this? <laughs> hold on, hold on. Yes. Yep. You got it. Yep. Okay. But that took that took a lot of operations and, and a lot of rework. That's a pretty good golfing hand now. Though. You did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good job. Must have been so painful, huh? Oh, it was very painful. Yeah. Very, very, very painful. I know that uh, I didn't I didn't sleep very much for some time without, mm. and they gave me morphine, of course, for as long as they could. But yeah. even beyond that, it was it was pretty tough. Uh, but that caused me to be evacuated because they couldn't they couldn't right. take there. I did I did finish the rest of the day, and. Uh, and I went went down to the aid station, and they was evacuated uh, by ambulance the next morning. So that was my tour in Korea that time. Mm. So you were evacuated back to hospital ship. hospital ship in Incheon was Busan. 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 Yeah. And then what happened? To Japan. To Japan. To the uh, hospital at uh, uh, Yokosuka. Do you remember when you were evacuated back to the battleship in, I mean, the medic, the hospital ship in Busan? Around? Just uh, month? 21st of uh, March. Oh, uh, no, it would have been about the 23rd of March. Okay, 1951. Right. And from there, I, I was sent back to the States. Mm. I spent about three days there. They operated on me a couple of times there, twice. Uh -huh. And then I went back to uh, California. And then California went to Great Lakes mm -hmm. Hospital. Uh, and then just briefly summarize the uh, career after you came from Korea and then you served in the Vietnam, right? Just well, briefly, I because Korea I have again. many different questions to ask you. Yeah, I went back to Korea again, this time as an aviator. Aviator? What a transformation from machine gun, heavy machine gun <laughs> to aviator. Yeah. How did it happen? Well, <clears throat> when I got out of the hospital, well, while I was in the hospital, well, before that, I take that back. Now, uh, let me trace back. I remember when I decided that I was going to go back to, when I'm going to remember I told you I went into the V5 program to start. Wow. Is That's that... the first thing I did when I got out of high school. Oh, okay. Yeah. I went into the V5 program. On East Hill, on the first of December, in the morning, we were running strikes on the, Ch on the Chinese, and I was in a foxhole with Jack DeLoach, and uh, we had uh, Corsairs that came in and did some nape runs, and I said, I'm going to do that. Mm. Those guys are going back to Japan 
or to a ship, they're going to take a hot shower, they're going to have a steak, <laughs> and here I am. I'm going to do that. Mm. So I put in for flight training. How long? Pardon? How long did you get the training? How long? Yeah. It, it varies. It varies. Uh, anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Depends on the individual. So that's uh, marine aviation? Uh -huh. Okay. They train, uh, they go through uh, uh, naval aviators. Mm -hmm. a, a, a marine aviator yeah. is uh, designated a naval aviator. Yeah. So uh, uh, I went. I went through. It took me twelve months. And then, when did you go back to Korea? Then, when I. Well, before I before that, let me let me trace back one other thing. It's interesting. <laughs> Uh, after I got out of the hospital, while I was in the hospital, uh, I checked with headquarters Marine Corps and said, when am I going to go to flight training? He said, well, we don't know right now. Right now you've got orders to Paris Island, which is recruit training. Mm -hmm. So I went, I was transferred when I got out of the hospital uh, in July. It wasn't six months, it wasn't six months, it was four months that I was worked on in July. I went to Paris Island. Mm. And I spent a uh, relatively short time, about four months there, and got orders to Pensacola, which was the beginning of flight training. Mm -hmm. And then I graduated from flight training with my wings and was sent to El Toro, California. Mm. And uh, went into a, a squadron of uh, Vomit 101, BMAT. I called it Vomit. <laughs> PMAT 101, which was a, a attack training squadron. They had uh, Corsairs and AT. Corsair. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent uh, about a year there and got orders back to Korea. This was in 19, now 1950. In 51, 52, 52, I went to flight training. Only 53? And, and I graduated in 53. Went to, went to, so early 54, I went back to Korea. Mm -hmm. And there I was put into a, 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 a BM, BMFA, or VMA then, 212. What? What base did you stage? Pardon? What base in Korea? Uh, I went to K-6. K-6 is where? That's at uh, to, 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 to south of the... K-6. What the heck's the name of that little town? Oh, okay. I'll find it out later. Monson? Huh? Is it near Monson? No. Oh. Look at... Look it up on Google. I said, where did you find that map in this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A bull Fisher, by the way, had, had two four in Vietnam. Ding Dong Bell was the one that had one one. Okay, we want K6. Okay. Shoot. That's my problem. I can't remember names now. Come tech. Tech That's right, yeah. Tong Tech. Mm -hmm. That's it. And there I did uh, work with, uh, the war was now over, fighting was now over. Yeah. And I did, uh, basically the main thing we did was train with infantry units, give them close air support, and uh, we also Every night we flew along 
the DMZ. Mm. We had patrols on the DMZ every night. Yeah. So did you have steak there? I had steak there. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you stay there in Pyeongtaek and in Korea? Your second... 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. And then you came back. Mm -hmm. And then participated in the Vietnam War. And when did you retire? 1983. As? At? As? As three-star. Three-star. Lieutenant General. Lieutenant General. And from what position? I was a commanding general of, uh, of uh, Marine Corps MacDeck, Marine Corps Education and Development Command. Education and Development Command. Command Quantico. Mm. Oh, it's been a long uh, Wait a you know, journey. You know what he did in Vietnam? Mm? You know what he did in Vietnam? Mm. He was the architect of the air defense plan for Quezon, Battle of Quezon. He was the commanding general of the evacuation of Saigon and Phnom Penh. Operation uh, Frequent Wind, he was the commanding general it's in April of 75. And you were? I was just, I was out by then. Okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Mm. He was a, he was a, a uh, Cobra pilot oh. in Vietnam. Oh. And he now, uh, he now uh, has the big sculpturing facility. My father's friends went to Vietnam War. You know, my mom didn't want him to, to go, so, but uh, my father... You father's, know when he was there? Huh? You know when he was in Vietnam? I don't remember. My father wasn't there. Oh, your my father? My father's was. friends went there. Uh, but let's go back to the Korean War. Okay. Have you been back to Korea? Yes. When? Well, I, I, the last time I was there was in 1980. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, that's right. After I retired was the last time. 1984. Ah, long time ago. Yeah. You, you need to, we no. need to bring you one more time there. Yeah. Well, I, I, did I tell you that Sonny... Yeah, Sonny lay in Utah. Sonny, Sonny uh, said, would, would you consider going to, back to Korea? Because they're having a, a, a big celebrations on the, the, Vietnam, uh, the Korean Vietnam yeah. people. And they want, they want somebody... I, see, I was there... I was there in 1963, 19, in Vietnam, mm -hmm. 1963, 67, 68, and 75. So uh, I was there at the beginning and the end mm -hmm. and the highlight. Yeah. It's not just for the Vietnam War, but still we need to bring you one more time for, you know, in Ch the, the chosen few, the Zhang Jin battle. And and, yeah, absolutely. So, what? How did you feel to see the Korea in 1984? You have a complete picture of before oh, and after, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it, please. I went to Incheon. Uh huh. I couldn't find the wall, <laughs> and it was so so many people there as compared to when I we made the landing. Mm. Because I remember when we made the landing, there was only just a few houses where we were. Mm. I remember one one particular house where we, we were. It was getting dark. We were trying making our way up to Radio Hill, and uh, I saw this Korean lady, the first woman, Korean woman I'd seen. She ran into the house in front of us. I remember that. Uh, we did a lot of, we saw a lot of people, a lot of Korean people on the roads. As I say, I had a corpsman that delivered a baby. Mm. They were, and the thing that, thing that really 
impressed me was the fact that uh, the Korean ladies were carrying a lot of a, a lot of things. Things on their on head. head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which uh, I said, boy, they they've got they've got things pretty good over here. The men have. <laughs> Uh, but I was going back to that. I was I was very, very impressed. Uh, it's nothing like it is now. I know that uh, from the pictures that I've seen. But I was very impressed with Seoul. Uh, of course, the last time I saw it was in rubble, basically, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the people were. Very, very, very cordial, very cordial, uh, especially to us. They would uh, uh, honor us in whatever way they could, mm -hmm. give us things. Uh, uh, the Korean president, I can't remember his name, but I've got it at home. I've got a wristwatch that he gave me. He's uh, President Chun, Chun Chun Du Hwan. Yep. In 1984, he was President Chun. Okay. His former uh, general, also. Yeah. Uh, they gave us very, uh, very, very fine food and uh, quarters. Treated us mm -hmm. exceptionally well. They took us to a little village, as I recall, a little, little. Uh, I think it was a commemoration village that they'd set up mm. at that time. I did make a talk at your stadium. They had a, a stadium there. Some way it was associated with the with the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Olympic Stadium. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think we were ready to have that stadium for Olympics because Olympic was in 1988. So maybe it's a different stadium. Or later we used it as one of the stadiums, I think. Yeah. But they wanted me to make a presentation here. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. having some sort of a celebration and they asked me to, to say a few words. I, I, I remember I got I got some Korean words at that time. I've forgotten them now. Mm -hmm. The only one I can remember is thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because it, but they, 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 uh, they went so much. I, I was impressed with the way uh, in the morning, they had a, like a reveille, and everybody went out on the streets and cleaned up the streets. Now, what is that called? <laughs> they don't, do they, do they still do that? No, no. But they, they had, they had a, like I say, it was like reveille, and, and everybody from the shops, and the stores, and everything went out and picked up things off the street, cleaned up the streets, and were sweeping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was, was uh, very, very clean, yeah. very, very clean. Uh, and of course, when we first landed, when we landed in Incheon and went up to Seoul, I mean, I, I, I remember seeing uh, little, little uh, like, like butcher shops along the, the, the streets. And all they'd have hanging up were meats, small things. Yeah. So they were very, very, very poor mm. at that time. Yeah. As compared to now, it's a very, very modern, and it was it was it changed a, a thousand percent better when I was there in the 80s. Yeah. KWV Youth Corps is a descendant, grandchildren of the Korean veterans. And I want to educate them and I want to send them to the country where they need help. It's like a peace corps. You know? So that's why we created uh, KWB Youth Corps 
and we're going to have a second convention this year in Washington DC from July 25th to 28th in Washington DC. I just signed the contract with the hotel there and we're going to have a interview project so that descendants can interview as I do now and they can collect the interviews from their own region, their own grandfathers. Let me ask a few more questions, okay? Sure. Um, so, I think you mentioned most of it, but I want you to summarize what is the legacy of the Korean War and the Korean War veterans, especially the Korean War and Korean War veterans. Right now, the Putins is in Ukraine and they're trying to get the Crimea and so on. And I don't think Cold War is finished in East Asia. So please talk about that. Well, what we, what we represent, what the Korean War veteran represents is, if you will, a, a group of, of uh, individuals that are very much uh, oriented to freedom, poor people. Mm -hmm. We were willing to go to Korea without many of us even knowing where it was. And we went because uh, of the, our, our heritage is freedom. And we like freedom for everybody. And the Koreans have demonstrated that. I think what, what really drove that point home to me was when we came out of the reservoir. Yeah. And there were all of these people that just left everything, everything they owned, except for what they could carry on their back. And they walked out under, when walked with us while we were fighting, braving death, the absolutely brutal weather with no shelter. And that to me demonstrated that it's worth fighting for. Because basically every human being has this desire for freedom. That's built into us. God mm -hmm. gave it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave us the, uh, the other thing that he gave us was the the gift of being able to make up your own mind. And that, that, that's freedom. He gave us freedom. Yeah. That's, that's the basic thing that he gave us. And you, you make your choice. Everybody can make their choice. And it's sad to me to see, for example, a, North Korea. Mm -hmm. North Korea, the, the people up there, they can't, they can't even communicate freely with some of their relatives in South Korea. Right. And that's a, that's a disaster. That really is. And that should be, somehow should be corrected. Right. And the things that you're, that you're doing now, uh, teaching, the children and so on, that reinforces that, that desire to correct that. That reinforces it. So I think that's, that's, that's a heritage that, that we all have. That's something. And it's particularly strong when you see what can happen mm -hmm. to a, a, a group or an area like South Korea. Yeah. Look at what you've done. Look at where you were. We were oppressed all those years, you know, from all the years of the occupation by the Japanese. You you had you had uh, lumber, for example. They took all your lumber. And and Korea is one of the one of the best producers of rice in the world. One of the best producers, and you were they took all that away from you. And then to see. You emerge out of that total oppression to where you are now. Yeah. Uh, you're a you're an example, for the world, for the world, of what can be done with just a little bit of a twist of freedom. 
what people can do themselves. Yeah, right? We were able to do that because you fought for us. Well, and that's, that's, that's one thing about, that's why to me, uh, I'm, I'm so, so uh, engrossed in this monument concept that I'm working on, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're working on. Yeah. I'm so engrossed in that and the sacrifices that were made for that. Uh, I covered in one of, the, one of the, the parts of the DVD where we had Catoosas, American soldiers, on that convoy trying to get out of the reservoir. Up to 500 of them. The Chinese set that, that convoy on fire, and none of them made it out. That's a, they were willing to sacrifice that in order to, to give people their freedom. I'm, I'm so glad that you made made point about Kutusas and their sacrifice because not many people really recognize what they did. Uh, in right. many different uh, important battles, and you're right, absolutely, that we need to recognize them, too. Yeah. Have you seen the sculpture they have in Korea of the Katusas? Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah. I, I discovered it on the internet. There's, uh, it's an American soldier in a Korean Katusa. Uh, uh, it's an a, a army base, recent, I think two or three years ago, maybe mm -hmm. dedicated. Um, well, even though it became very significant symbol of the freedom and democracy and the capitalism, looking back those 60 years, okay, and Korean War was the signal of the confrontation between Soviet Union and the United States, but still it has been regarded as forgotten very unpopular, not many people remember, and people ask the returning Korean War veterans, where have you been for two years? Why is that? Well, I think it, from, from our standpoint, we had, a, we had a long, well, it wasn't really that long in today's history. For example, Afghanistan and, and Iraq, ten years. Yeah, uh, we had World War II. World War II, yes. Which was four years, uh, but it was very intense. We had a lot of casualties, a lot of uh, sacrifice by in, in all ways, um, and on top of that, we're almost well within five years of the end of that, here comes Korea. Mm. Um, people were fed up with war. Uh, un unfortunately, I feel that, that uh, Americans are very spoiled and we like to, we like to, we like to have uh, our cake and eat it too. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> Not spoiled. And, 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 and uh, really, really, the press highlighted certain things, like our battle, mm. the, the Battle of the Chosen. I've got a newspaper at home, which uh, New York Times, which, which shows, uh, talks about this battle and the fact that they're not going, they may not get out and so on. Uh, but then it's forgotten, pushed aside. And, and the thing that, that uh, war is, war is very uh, cold and gruesome and, and uh, you don't like to talk about it too much. Right. Really don't. Uh, people don't like to talk about the, the casualties and the, the hazards and, and the results of it. And, and uh, our, our, our media, as a result, played down 
I think, played down, actually played down the Korean War. Mm -hmm. To them, they said that this is not a popular thing to do now. We've had enough. So I think that's the main reason that, okay. that it's, it's titled The Forgotten War. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's sad. And what you're doing with the youth to educate them, that, well, even our, our history books now are controlled. And that shouldn't be. Right. That shouldn't be. You shouldn't have one paragraph about the Korean War and maybe a, a, a war that, that was uh, more, more uh, the Americans were more involved in the World War II has maybe a page in the history books. Yeah. You are trying to erect a monument, right? right? Could you summarize that your project? And with that, I want to conclude this interview. Yeah. It's most important that we we talk about this this monument because in the history of warfare. The Battle of the, of the Changjin Reservoir was, had few equals, if any. Mm. The brutality of the weather, the fact of the odds of fighting our way out mm. were, were practically zero. We were, we were faced in, in a typical attack in the military. You look for three to one ratio, three attackers for one defender. Mm. In this case, we had to attack out and we had one attacker versus six offender defenders. So the odds of us getting out were very, very small. And aside from that, the fact that actually it was very, very important to South Korea, to Korea as a whole, mm -hmm. that we overcome the Chinese because they had stated, and this is a part of our a part of our project, and will be uh, in it, it's actually in our DVD, for example, the statement of Chairman Mao to his military commanders that let's annihilate these forces here at the Changjin and when we annihilate them, the United Nations will say, whoa, we don't belong there. And what would have happened to Korea then? Mm -hmm. It had been back to the same thing it was under the Japanese, maybe even worse. Mm -hmm. So to me, uh, we need to we need to highlight this battle as one of the, if not in today's world, the most important battle of that war. The, the Eighth Army had, had been they'd been annihilated. The 283 mile retreat of the Eighth Army. The only thing left was the Tenth Corps. If they'd, they'd have lost the Tenth Corps, the war would have been lost for sure. Yeah. So where are you going, going to have this monument, and what is your uh, kind of idea that you want to have it done? The monument will be, and we already have a, a choice place, mm -hmm. will be at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Where is it? And that is located at Quantico, which is just south of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason that it, it uh, is there, one of, the, one of the good reasons that it is there is because uh, of the, the history of the Marine Corps, is, is, it attracts people. Yep. It attracts people to, to come there. And the, the, the museum is a magnificent museum. This is a, this is a brochure of it, and it, it, uh, it covers the entire history of the Marine Corps, from its beginning, and even now, they're putting up another 80,000 square feet mm -hmm. building to, to remember Iraq and Afghanistan. So it covers 
the entire history of the Marine Corps, and it will it will cover with this battle right now within the within the museum itself. They feel that the Korean War was so important as to uh, one of the companies that was involved in a survival battle uh -huh. uh, has an entire room dedicated to it, and that room is even chilled to down to 30 degrees, down to freezing level. When you walk in the room, to remind, to remind you of the brutality. That's not really very cold to to a Korean to a chosen not chosen but uh, Changin reservoir minus sixty minus sixty degrees with with uh, so uh, we have to we have to recognize some of the qualities of the military and the sacrifices that were given were made at that, at that battle. General, thank you very much. It's my honor and very lucky to have you in Dallas and hear from you the details of your uh, older uh, combat stories. And I was moved that you all prayed and I think God answered to your prayer. Yes, and I hope that God will answer your last prayer to erect the monuments. Thank you. Beautiful in a uh, museum. And I want to thank you uh, all the veterans on um, behalf of Korean nation that we were able to do what we are doing now because of you. It's been our honor. It's our honor to 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 talk about the war, and the dedication, and the appreciation of the Korean people. Thank you. Thank you.